well, I grew up in Los Angeles. I grew up, lived on Compton Boulevard as a kid. Grew up in Southeast LA. Uh, my dad left us when I was six weeks old. I had no siblings, empty house. And time I was 14, um, I was already doing drugs. I was 13, I was doing drugs, but 14, I've already done opium, LSD, weed. And I came home and told my mom, hey, I wanna be honest with you, I'm doing drugs. And at 14 years old, the next day, my mom had me committed to a mental institution for eight months of my life with adults. They strapped me into bed, took my clothes away from me, and uh, bitterness and hatred got in my life. And I gravitated to the punk rock scene in the early 80s. And um, time I was 16, I had already overdosed twice, had my stomach pumped. Um, Sin's fun for a while. You got to pay the price. I mean, I, I got thrown out my bedroom window when I was 15 and lived on my own right through the glass. And I'm selling drugs. I had a house at 17, 16 years old living there and uh, had all kinds of money. And I kept sticking it all on my arms, shooting up, got hepatitis. Someone's trying to kill me. And then these Mexican gang members let me hide out in their garage. I didn't know they were Christian. And I wasn't saved, but they were Christian. And I'm 19, crazy, blue hair, insane looking. And they let me live in there. And for three weeks, they're praying for me. And I'm still getting loaded. And at the third week, uh, I went on a three-day speed binge and didn't sleep for three days, went out and did some evil, evil things those three days. And at the end of the third day, no sleep, gone crazy. Um, I came home at 10 in the morning from no sleep. And I don't know what happened, but something threw me to the ground. And I said, God, if you're real, I can't do this. I cried out. When I got up, I never smoked. I never drank. I never got high. Jesus changed my life. They took me to church. I walked into a church of 1,200 people in 1987, all gang members. I'm the only white dude there besides the preacher. And I'm thinking, I'm going to get killed, man. They all lifted up their hands. I'm like, oh, no. F13, 18 streets here. And I'm like, oh, no. And, but no, they were really saved. And this white guy from Oklahoma was preaching. was my pastor. I got saved at 19. I met my wife in church of 36 years now, Esther, and um, married, saved at 19, married at 21, pastoring at 25. What are you doing with your life? Give it to Jesus. Let him use you. Let him use you. Let him use you. So... I said this this morning in the first one, like, man, this is a cool church. Love it. Reminds me so much of my church. But, like, I want to remind us, what are we doing here? Why are we here? Why do we do this thing, church? Why do we get saved? What is this all about? And sometimes it gets lost in our American culture of Christianity. It's real simple. This is about hell. This, everything in the New Testament is about hell. We don't want to talk about it. Christmas is coming up. Christmas is about hell. Unto us, a Savior is born. To save you from what? From hell. Easter's coming. What is it about? He died and rose again so you don't have to go to hell. And we don't want to talk about it, you know, and tell your neighbor, I don't want to go to hell. Come on, turn your rusty neck and tell your neighbor, I don't want to go to hell. Don't tell them to go to hell. Tell them I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> listen, listen. I get it, man. We, you got saved and you changed your drug habit. I'm, you got saved and he saved your marriage. I, I get it that 
you know, you became a more productive citizen becoming a Christian. That's great. And you bring your family and your kids to a safe environment called church. But it's bigger than that. Listen to me. It's bigger than that. It is so much bigger than that. Our theology, if I asked you, do you believe Jesus is coming back? We'd probably say yes. Bible prophecy is happening all around us. If I asked you, do you believe in heaven? We'd say yes, but we have to ask ourselves this question. How much has your theology changed your lifestyle? Because what you say you believe is not what you believe. What you believe is how you live your life. Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, unless a man be born again, he will not even see the kingdom of God. You ever stop and think how many people you drove from your house to here that are going to hell? You, you work eight to ten hours a day. You're on a route. You're in a cubicle. You're in a high school, a junior high. And let me get this straight. You have the only answer that's going to get them to heaven. You want to go on a missions trip around the world, but you've not knocked on your neighbor's door. Do you really believe in this? American churches like this illustration. There's a two-story house. Oh, that's a good-looking dude. <laughs> Take a picture of that, and, and you can save my face, too. <laughs> Follow me on Instagram? No. Listen. <laughs> but the American church is like a two-story house, and you're walking down the street, and, and there's your friends. Up on the, There's your family, your parents, your kids, your grandparents your co-workers, the people you go to school with, and they're up there watching the game, having a good time, just fellowship, and have, not even per se doing bad. They're just up there. And you walk by, and the bottom floor is on fire. What do you do? Are, are you taking the approach, I don't want to bother them and, and offend them because they're having such a good time? Or, or would you do whatever it takes to get their attention? And you're screaming and you're yelling and you're throwing rocks. You're, you're calling the fire. You're doing whatever you can. They're yelling. And they're looking at the one. I don't see no fire. You're overreacting. Calm down. Okay, you're right. I don't want to bother. But is that what you would do? Humanity is going to hell. And the only answer is not only Jesus. The only answer is you. The only Jesus the world's going to see is the one that lives inside of you and me. The Bible says they can't get saved without a preacher, without someone sharing the gospel. See, well, before you got saved, Christianity was about you. But once you get saved, it's about everyone else but you. Come on. Uh, our brother that came up here and did prayer talking about souls, we want to have the heart of God. Well, here's the heart of God. I wish none perish, but all come to repentance. Oh, oh that, that's what Christianity is about. And I, I know this is uncomfortable, but let me, let me plead my case for a moment because I feel like I didn't just come here to preach my best sermon. I really prayed about this. And there's very little preaching about this subject in America. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. Because there's no preaching about hell, we have hell in our streets. That, that, that's why we have lost the complete fear and reverence of God. That's why they're sexually confused. That's why in my city, every day, someone's dying of a fentanyl overdose. That's why the chaos that we see in us Christians, sometimes we just look at the news and, and social media and say, I can't believe they're living this way. But you have the answer. Jesus said, he's narrow, I am the only way. There's no other way. I am the only way to the Father. In the Great Commission, which is a command for in my name, if you're following me, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's not about a 501c3. It's not about starting your own little ministry and your title and those things that stroke our egos. That's just you at the gas station. Someone's right on the other side of the pump. Yes. Come on. Yes. Do you think that's just an accident? The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord right. at the right moment, at the right time. I didn't share this in the first service, but I remember being a young man, 19, I got saved, and I remember we're preaching 
on this place called Whittier Boulevard where all the cruisers are and the low riders and it's late at night and I'm preaching and I'm witnessing to this dude. He's on his interceptor. He's on his motorcycle. This is the 80s and he's sitting there with talking to two girls and I'm witnessing to him and, and I go, dude, there's a reason I'm talking to you. There's a reason we can't, dude, you're trying to scare me. You sound like my mom. I said these words. I go, bro, you don't know. Tonight, you can pull out this driveway and die. God is my witness. He laughed in my face, pulled out that driveway. A car with three girls that were drunk hit him. He went flying. I ran out there, took off my, I still had my leather jacket. I was a new convert. I took it off. I'm not asking if he's okay. I said, say the sinner's prayer as he's choking on blood. So what am I saying? I believe that nothing happens by chance. Not even this message today. There's a reason you're here. There's a reason I'm here. And it's interesting. In our progressive world today, people don't dare preach about this. They say hell's, you know, it's old school. It's out of date thinking, out of date preaching. Well, it may be out of date, but hell's not out of business. Since I started speaking, people have went to hell. I guess the question is, do we care? Do we care? Hell's the eternal home for those who reject Jesus. You don't go to hell because of a bad start. You go to hell because of a bad finish. God doesn't send nobody to hell. We send ourselves there by rejecting the gospel and living a hypocritical, lukewarm life. Churches have become, I've been fascinated that all the thousands of people in this city, in my city, go to church on Sunday, and on Monday, they don't tell nobody about Jesus. I mean, how do you get saved in a church? Most churches don't even do altar calls. We'll give you a cappuccino. We'll give you a gift. We don't even give a presentation to get saved because we don't want to offend you. So let me get this straight. We're just going to lie to you. Tell you everything's okay so we can get your money and then the rapture happens or you go to hell. Why am I talking about this? There's some statistics that people don't realize. Do you know your loving, inclusive savior? You know, the humble man on the cross, the baby in the manger, spoke twice as much about hell than he did heaven. People don't even realize that. Do you know that Jesus spoke more about hell that all the writers in the Bible combined. Christian means to be Christ-like. Now, for the sake of time, I've shortened my message because I, I've had all the verses that Jesus did. Do a study on it. He spoke more about it than all the writers combined. I thought we're supposed to preach what Jesus preached. Jesus said this in Matthew 13, 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it onto the shore and they sat down and the good fish and they put the good fish in the crates and threw the bad ones away. That was the way it was at the end. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into a fiery furnace where there'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. Jesus said that there is a great separation coming of humanity. There's no purgatory, there's no reincarnation. It's not in the Bible. It's heaven or hell. I mean, everyone here is different. I like this church. Everyone's different, different age, different background, different nationalities. But there's one thing that every person in this room has in common. You're going to die. Every human in here will die. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, then the judgment. It's a sobering thought. We feel so immortal till we go to a funeral. Jesus is talking about weeping, gnashing of teeth. Why did he talk about it? He wanted to save us. I want to throw something out there. I'll 
I don't want to get ahead of myself. I said it last night. You're saying, you know, you were a drug addict. Well, heroin's no different than hate. LSD's no different than lying. PCP's no different than pornography. If you're a guest in this church trying to decide if this is your church, uh, Brother Jeremiah and his wife that came up here and testified, there's the final product. Somebody's life was changed. This is a good church. Uh, you, you need to come here. People's lives are being changed. You know, they're giving up things. God set them free. <laughs> it inspired me a lot. Jesus, ready? Here's Jesus, the loving Savior. How fanatical was he? Let's see. Mark 9.43. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand than go into the unquenchable fires of flames with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's better, to have, it's better to enter eternal life with only one foot than be thrown into hell with two feet. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. For it is better to enter the kingdom of heaven with only one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. You're trying to scare me, pastor. No, no, I just read you the scripture. It's funny what happens when you read what the Bible actually says. See, ask yourself, you know, our, our brother came up here and said, I had to get rid of my friends. I had to cut this out of my life. Sometimes we have to change our playmates in our playground to serve God. Jesus. Oh, yeah. The loving Savior. He just so loving. He doesn't care how we act. Okay. But I say to you, Matthew 5, 22, if you say you're angry with someone, you're in the subject of judgment. Judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in the danger of being brought before the court. If you curse at someone, you are in the dangers of the fires of hell. Matthew 12, 36. I promise you, Jesus said, I promise you, on the day of judgment, everyone will have to give an account for every careless word they have spoken. How much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them the truth about this? Was that, that's what they say about us Christians. You preach hate. Really? How much do I have to hate to you to not tell you where you're going to go? That's hate. This is not about liberals, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, black, white. This is about heaven or hell. Look at my hands. Look at my hands. This is 80 years of your life. Looks small. Pastor, this doesn't look like much. This is what it really looks like when you compare it to eternity. God asks you to give this much for that much. To be a part of his kingdom. See, Jesus didn't just save you to heal you, deliver you. He wanted you to be a part of his kingdom. He saved you to give you a testimony to save other people. He saved you because he knew that you had an unsafe family member. And if I can touch them and see the light. See, Jesus didn't say he's the light of the world. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And I said it last night. Most churches spend, they just salt the salt. They create a ministry just to reach other Christians. And when people are dying, they need Jesus. The gospel's for the lost. It's for the broken. It's like winning the lotto. Hundred million dollars. These numbers are crazy. And then you don't give nobody nothing? You got the precious pearl, the treasure, eternal life. How do we not share this? How do we not tell them? Tri cities need you. <laughs> Human life, we should care. You, you, you could have been born any time in history. 
Hear, hear me. God is the creator of life. He could have you exist 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth. But he didn't. Could have been 100 years ago. No, God wanted you for some reason to be alive in 2024. But not just alive in 2024, saved. Filled with his spirit. He chose you. You came in agreement with that thing. So why? The Bible says the church is the pillar of all truth and you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. God expected you. You are responsible. This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of sinners. Luke 16, 19. Now, um, I'm going to read you this. I think it's phenomenal. Jesus talking here. This is like a porthole, a, a spiritual behind the scenes. What Jesus talks about, two men. One goes to heaven, one goes to hell. This is not a preacher trying to scare you. This is Jesus telling this story. It's, it's kind of like today. Completely different lives. Two different guys. Listen to what Jesus said. There was a rich man who wore expensive clothes. Every day was like a party to him. There was also a beggar named Lazarus who was regularly brought to the gate of the rich man's house. Lazarus would have eaten the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Lazarus was covered with sores and dogs would lick them. One day the beggar died and angels carried him to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. He went to hell where he was constantly tortured. And as he looked up in the distance, he saw Abraham and Lazarus. He yelled, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue, for I'm suffering in this fire. Abraham replied, remember my child that you had a life filled with good times. Lazarus' life was filled with misery. Now he is peace here while you suffer. Two people. Number one, I guarantee you this poor man is poorer than anyone in this room. He lives off crumbs that fall off someone's table. He would grow up in the wrong family. Everything went wrong, wrong neighborhood. Everything went bad in his life. Everything went wrong. He couldn't get a break. He's homeless. He's a beggar, starving. But he had something that money couldn't buy. That was a relationship with God. And when he died, he went to heaven. The other guy, if you study what theologians describe him, this rich man, he's the top 1% of his day. The millionaires, the billionaires. He had stuff that only you and I could dream of. He had everything he wanted. But money can't buy you salvation. It can't do that. And he's in hell. The Bible says he died, he went to hell, where he's constantly tortured. And the first thing he says, have mercy on me. He's not asking for justice. He's asking for mercy. He got justice. He's asking, calling out to God. He just waited too late to call out to Jesus. And what is he saying? He says, send Lazarus to tip, dip his finger in water and put a drop on my tongue to cool me off and give me comfort. One heartbeat earlier, he can buy the most expensive bottle of wine or champagne, and now he can't even buy a drop of water, which makes me wonder, Jesus is telling the story, how much pain do you have to be in that a drop of water gives you any kind of comfort? How much torture that you're, you're reduced, but not a bottle, you're begging for a drop. He's in hell and he's praying. You know what the craziest thing is? The next verse. Remember, my child, in your lifetime. You had everything you wanted. According to what Jesus said, if somebody dies and goes to hell, you remember everything. You remember your whole life. You remember this sermon. You remember Jeremiah's testimony and his wife. You, you, remember, you, well, you remember every time somebody shared the gospel with you and you ignored it. And you told them, I go to Hungry Gen. But you're not living for God. Church does not make you a Christian. Just like going to five guys don't make you a hamburger. Okay. 
You, you remember every time that you told people, stop judging me. You're legalistic. All those little arguments. You remember every time you were in your car by yourself or in bed by yourself and the Holy Spirit was telling you, when are you going to really serve me? When are you going to stop doing that and surrender to me? And you, every time you got in trouble, you cried out to God, yeah, I will, I will tomorrow. And you keep doing it. When you die, there's not going to be a, you know, us here like this, but there will be a God, and he's not going to ask you, were you hungry, Jin? Were you Baptist? Were you Catholic? Were you Methodist? Were you Assembly of God? Those are just games here on earth in church. <laughs> Listen, those are, you know, we all tribe up. I get it. God uses it, but really, none of that's going to matter. He's going to ask you, did you really serve my son? Uh, did you really serve and give your life to my son? That's what he's going to ask you. He's not going to ask you if you tithe. He's not going to ask you your church attendance. <laughs> Remember. You know what? What's interesting? The, it's not. I don't. I didn't give it to him. But the next verse says, "Send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment." So let me get this straight. He's praying in hell. He wants to do an outreach. But when he was alive, he never prayed and he never told people about Jesus. Isn't it funny? Now he believes in giving to evangelism. Now he believes in prayer. You ever, this is, just tell me what Jesus said. You ever think about how many people are going to hell? You ever like pause and really think about it? <laughs> because the way the gospels preach, everyone's going to heaven. Is that biblical? Okay, well, let's see what Jesus said. Matthew 7, 13. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. The gate is wide, and many choose that way. But the gateway to life is narrow. The road is difficult, and only few find it. Jesus uses two words, many and few. According to Jesus, most of humanity is not going to heaven. Not because he wants to throw people in hell, but because people choose their sin and their compromise over their life of God. And who told you coming to God all your problems would go away? He says the road's difficult. I'm going to be honest with you. Christianity is not easy. Try going against your flesh. Try having the devil mad at you and people come against you. I lived a crazy life. Home invasions, getting arrested. and I got kicked out of every school. I was in so much trouble. Can I tell you, as a Christian, I had a more harder life. I lost a child. My wife got, my wife got messed up and we couldn't have kids where she almost died. Well, I've been attacked like your pastor online and people come against you. I've been shot at as a pastor. People trying to bring guns in my church and kill me. I've had all kinds of things happen. Who said it was going to be easy? Jesus said it's difficult. Few are willing to pay that price. I guess this is the point of the question right now. Many and few. If you're a Christian... Do you care? I guess this is the right point of the message is this is not here. To, you know, like, do you care? Are you going to knock on your neighbor's door or let the Jehovah Witnesses do it? I mean, the Girl Scouts knock on the door more than you. I mean, what are you going to do at work tomorrow? I tell my church, I tell my church, stop telling people about the cure church. I said it for years. You tell them about Jesus and you get them saved and they'll come to church. That's our job.
I'm going to read a scripture. It's not from Jesus. It's in Revelation chapter 21. And this is John that wrote this. John is codenamed the apostle of love. Nobody in the Bible wrote more about love than John. Love, 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 love. He buddy love, man. He's the brother love. Well, this is what brother love said. In Revelation 21, verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. He said, I mean, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write these words down that are true and faithful. He said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give it the fountain of water of life freely to whom it thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He will be my son. Stop, look at me. I'm going to read you one more verse. And I'm shocked at how many Christians don't know this verse exists. It's a verse in one verse of everyone who goes to hell. It's in one verse. It's a list that you don't want to be on. You can't escape it. It's there. The next verse. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let me, you see who the first one on the list is? It's, it's, it's the cowardly. Let me tell you who the cowardly are not. They are not unbelievers. The second one on the list is unbelievers. So that means everyone else on this list had knowledge of Jesus and even believed. Unbelievers have their own category. Quit living delusional. Read the Bible how it's supposed to be read. Unbelievers are unbelievers. So don't be pointing at These are people that know Jesus and choose not to. They believe in him even. So who are the cowardly? They're the ones that are, what we forget that Jesus said, if you're embarrassed to me before men, if you're ashamed of me before men, or if you deny me before people, I will deny you before my heavenly father. Jesus said that. Let me break it down. They go to church. Doesn't mean they don't go to church, but they go home and they're too embarrassed to tell their grandkids and their children or their parents or grandparents about Jesus because they don't want to make them mad. They go to work and everyone cusses and says their stuff and you're too ashamed, embarrassed of what it would cost you on relationships. You're the cowardly. You're at high school. You love God here, but down there, you're too embarrassed to stand up for Jesus. Christianity is not a private religion. It's personal. You confess me before men. I confess you for Heavenly Father. You deny me before men. I will deny you for Heavenly Father. Silence is consent to this world. They're, they're lukewarm Christians. They're lukewarm. That's the cowardly. We forget Jesus had rather be hot and cold. They're too afraid to go all out for God because it's going to cost them some things. They're afraid of what it might cost them, their job, their money, their time. They're, they're afraid. I'm not trying to be cold, but that's, that's what this literally means. I've studied this scripture for many years. The second one on the list is the, is the uh, unbelievers. Now, praise God, I, I've have the great honor of preaching all over the world. I filled up three passports preaching. My wife was born in Havana, Cuba. That means she has a machete and she can cut me anytime she wants. <laughs> My wife was born under a dictatorship of Fidel Castro. And hearing the stories from her mom and dad, uh, they're terrible. We live in America. I I've actually snuck into Cuba a few times and the last time I went, I got caught preaching. And it's against the law. And they took me straight to the airport and put me on a plane. I had no idea where I was going. I'm like, please don't send me to Russia. I mean, I know there's Russians here. Nothing against you. <laughs> but I was like, I, I, I ended up in some town in Mexico and made my way home from there. But it's not freedom. America is a great place. You have the freedom to believe what you want to believe. And you may be here. Yeah, you should be happy about that. But you may be here and say, someone brought me real nice people 
interesting, but I don't believe. And you have that right in America to believe what you want to believe. And you may be here and say, I don't believe. But as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I have a responsibility to me. If you're an unbeliever, you're still on a list, whether you believe it or not. The next one on the list, it's a King James word. It's the abominable. It's a big word, but I'm going to break it down easy what it means in the Greek. It's simply, it simply means the epitome of worldliness. That's what it means. Those that are consumed by the culture and the recreations of this world, and they have no time for God. Oh, they know God, but, but the world's consumed them. Let me, let me prove my point. You know the Kardashians by name, but you can't name the apostles. That's how much the world's consumed us. They're the ones that wake up and say, I don't know if I'm going to church. There's a game today. There's something else. It's a Lord's Day. We don't do that no more. And all of a sudden now we have this whole philosophy. You don't have to go to church to be saved. I get that church doesn't save nobody. But everyone in the Bible went to church, including Jesus. Every single New Testament Christian went to church. And we live in a time today that everything else, the world's more important. Recreation, family, so forth. It's called the Lord's Day. I'm not harping on it, but Jesus, like it's commanded in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of the brethren, that you see the day of Jesus' return approaching more. You should even meet more often. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it, the Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of God. Not I was mad when they said unto me. But it, uh, the point I'm trying to make is the world's consumed us and we don't even realize it. We, 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 know, we, we know every favorite series. And I'm not against. You can watch things. You can do things. You know, but if that's consumed you more. I mean, did you not remember that Jesus said, if you love the world, you're an enemy of me? He literally says, to love the world, you're committing adultery on me. You adulterers, you love the world more than me. Did we not forget that? And I mean it, they're not unbelievers. Just, you know, Christianity's like, eh, I'll pray if I want. I'll do this, it's not that important. Now, if you leave while I'm preaching, I'm gonna think you're scared. If you don't like me, the Ukrainian will be here next week. Amen. <laughs> What's the next one? Oh, the murderers. I, I hope you've never taken no one's life, but this is the New Testament. So what did Jesus call murder? Jesus said, if you hate somebody, you've committed murder. Do you hate anybody? I mean, not this, oh, I love them, but we just don't like them. You know, let's throw away all that, you know, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile. What good is it if you love those who treat you the way you want? Anyone can do that, but love those who speak evil about you and treat you bad and lie about you and great is your reward in heaven. How about, you know, I heard all that. I've been pastoring a long time. You know, you know, how do you know if you hate somebody, you know? Every time you hear their name, it triggers you. Kamala Harris. <laughs> Donald Trump. Are you triggered? I mean, what, do you want them to go to hell? I mean, you're a child of God. Jesus said, if you hate them, you know, I hear it. Church books. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me and my family. You don't know what they did to me when I was young. I could never forgive them. Do you forget what murder is? Jesus said, if you don't forgive everyone, my heavenly father will not and cannot forgive you. And we just, we, we hide behind our religiosity when we hold grudges instead of, you know, forget, leave your gift at the altar and go make peace with your brother. Unforgiveness, it's murder. Let me, let me tell you another thing of New Testament murder. If you're prejudiced, you don't like white people, you don't like black people, you don't like other races, you're not going to heaven. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you preach. I don't care if you give. I don't care if you sing on the worship team. I don't care. 
you're not going to heaven. The Bible says, how can you say you love God who you haven't seen and you hate your brother who God made in his own image, therefore the love of God is not in you. And this world has tried, America's tried to divide us with politics and hatred and so forth. The Bible says when you get saved, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We are all one in Christ. Kind of forget we all came from one guy, Adam. We just all have different tans. Jesus died for the world. He didn't die for the black man, the white man. He died for the world, the human race. You put God's kingdom over culture. Oh, and this thing about murder, I, I, this is not a political statement, even though we've been brainwashed to believe it is. Every single time, abortion is murder. It is murder. You can't be a Christian and say it's not murder. I'm tired of hearing people say, well, you understand the government, this is my body. Look, let me give you an example. You're right. This is your body. The baby inside of you is somebody else's body. The right to choose to murder. Well, you don't understand about well, if something happened. All life comes before God. I, f I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. I don't care how that happened. God loves them, has a plan for them, and a testimony of his redemption. I know that makes you mad, and if you're a woman and you've been brainwashed, the devil's a liar. Let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. How is it when you don't want a baby and you see two lines on a stick, it's a fetus, but when you are married and you want a kid, you see the same two lines and it's called a baby? Oh, man. The next one. It don't get easier. The sexually immoral is the next one on the list. This word explodes in the Greek. You know what it means? Sex before marriage. Fornication. Sex outside of marriage. Adultery. And what's called the shiviousness and lewdness and homosexuality and perversions and all that stuff that we're seeing today. It's on a list. You can fight it, say whatever you want. It's on a list. I mean, how many times do you have to fornicate to be a fornicator? Did, did we not forget that Jesus said, if you look at someone in lust, it's the same as doing it. You know, when I, you know, our, our, our brother Jeremiah gave his testimony and he talked about the deliverance from pornography. But, and I grew up pre-internet. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Pre-cell phone, pre-internet. And so, you know, if you wanted to look at porn as a teen, you, 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 there he goes. He's scared. He's running out. <laughs> the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> look, look. No, but when I wanted to look at porn, you know, you had to go to your friend's house and, and the dad had a cardboard box hidden from his wife in the garage. You looked at your little Playboy magazines or whatever. Not now. According to the FBI, the first exposure of pornography is 10 years old because some parent thought it was smart to give their kid a smartphone. Uh -uh, just like, look at the world, unsupervised. And we wonder why they want to change their gender. They're sexually confused. They've left in that. We don't even understand what their relationships are going to be like to be overexposed later on. But let me give you some other statistics according to sex trafficking. According to the FBI, one out of three girls will be molested in America, one out of four boys. By those sheer numbers, there are victims and perpetrators in this room. Sexual morality is out of hand because, you know, looking is not good enough. Eve looked at the fruit. She coveted it. Then she wanted to take a bite of it. And people have been looking at this, and now they want to experience it. I mean, Jesus literally said, if you're right, I offend you, pull it out. Maybe you need to go back to a flip phone. I literally know guys that did that. I mean, what do you got to do? I mean, that's what he said. Oh, then it says the I, the sorcerers. I know you're thinking, thank God he didn't get me on that one. I'm not into Harry Potter. 
But Jesus, th this is the King James, and, and you have to, the original language in the Greek is the word, Jesus, people perish for lack of knowledge. The, the, the word is the word pharmakia, where we get the word pharmaceutical drugs. The, if the root meaning of this word is intoxication, getting high, getting drunk. It is bizarre how many Christians want to fight about getting, dr getting drinking. I mean, they, 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 it's like they just want to hold on to that. And like, <laughs> um, I mean, there used to be a time, like our brother said, I left my drugs. I left this. I got delivered. What does Jesus deliver you from? What do you get delivered from? I've been from what? And said, well, you don't understand. I, I, it just, you know, I unwind. There's nothing wrong with it. I thought the relax, that's what the Holy Spirit's job was. <laughs> Speaking tongues. He's the comforter. <laughs> I've done my study on this. Is, yeah, I know, I know. But I'm telling you something you don't like. You want to call me legalistic. That's usually what happens. But, but here's the reality. You know, alcohol now compared to the Bible is not even close to the same. And matter of fact, there was milk. Fruit of the vine, fermented alcohol, water, and bad water. Have you been to the store lately? You see all the options. You see all the sodas, the drinks, and all that. And we still got to go there because it's our flesh. And we'll forget about the part of me and Pastor Vlad or Pastor Rick Hart went out to eat today. And we, in moderation, just had a glass of wine. And some new person in the church had heard us preach today. said, oh, I guess it's okay to drink. But then they get drunk and get a DUI and hurt somebody. You know what the Bible says? It's our fault. We caused somebody else to stumble. Why? Where are those Christians that are not looking out? Oh, they're only looking for their self. And, and you know, you, you know I, I don't want my kids to grow up seeing alcohol in the house. I mean, we live in this interesting time now that weed's legal. Well, it's natural. It's legal. God made it. God made sharks. You don't swim with sharks. I mean, I mean, we, well, I, I've heard every excuse there is, well, it's better than, than you know, abusing pills. I, here's, here's the answer to that. Don't abuse pills. If the doctor gives you a prescription, do it exactly the way he says, and when it's over, quit getting more. It's intoxication. You can fight it. You can argue about it. But here's the line. I don't know the line. It's different with everybody else. Why do we want to be so close to the line? Why do we want to be, I mean, we live this Christianity. What can I get away with and still go to heaven? What's my least commitment to God and go to heaven? My beautiful wife, Esther, we've been married 36 years. That's like me telling my wife, sweetheart, adultery is grounds for divorce. I will not cheat on you, but you see that woman over there. Can I French kiss her? The machete comes out. She going to tell me no, but I'm not going to sleep with her. Okay. 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 Can I kiss her on the lips? No. There's a Latin up front. <laughs> well, can I hug her? Just embrace her chest? No. A marriage is not what can I get away with? The Bible says we are the bride of Christ. He is the groom and we're telling the Lord American Christians. We're telling the Lord, I won't deny your name, but can I do this and go to heaven? What can I get away with and go to heaven? What's my least commitment? That's not Christian. When you love somebody, you go the extra mile for them. You sacrifice for them. You do what pleases them because you love them. Oh, somebody thank God right now. The next one on the list is the idolaters. And usually we think about idolatry, we think about statues we used to pray to or some tribal people. But what did Jesus call idolatry? Jesus said, if you love your mother, father, brother, sister, or anything more than me, you cannot be my disciple. Idolatry is anything you put before your walk with God. And I hear people, I can't serve God because of my spouse. I can't serve God because of my parents. I can't serve God because of my kids. I can't serve God right now because of what we're going through. I can't serve God because of my job. Let me get this straight. 
They ripped the beard out of his face. They tortured him. I know you worked hard for that career. But you're going to stand before God and say, I can't serve you because of a job? Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Here's my answer. Get another job. It's not that easy. I know. But do you think there's a God in heaven looking down and you're praying, God, make a way for me that he's going to go up there? Oh, heck no. That's so dumb of you to quit your job and serve me. But you expect him to forgive you of all your sins. God will help you. God will bless you. He'll make a way. He will make a way. Don't let nothing become between your prayer life, your worship of God. Jesus has to be number one. Seek first the kingdom of God. Then all these things will be added unto you. Food, clothing, shelter. But it's putting God first. Sorry, it's on a list. And the last one on the list, it's, it's pretty straight. The last one, listen, says, and all the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Not, not, look at me. I'm being very serious here. It says all the liars. Do you lie? I want you to pause for a moment. Do you lie? Do you lie to your family? Do you lie in your job? Do you lie at school? Do you lie to the government because you think they owe you something? You know what scripture always fascinated me about lying? Is that the Bible says Satan is the father of all lies. According to the Bible, every lie is birthed through Satan. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and Satan's the father of all lies. You're a son of one of them. It doesn't say, well, it's not that. I didn't want to hurt their feelings. Do you lie? I I know some of you are like, this guy's just being judgmental. How? I'm reading you the Bible, and I don't know how you live. How can I judge you? I'm just reading you the Bible. Most of what I said was just scripture. Real slow. First Corinthians 15 33. Don't fool yourselves. Bad friends will destroy you. Be sensible. Stop sinning. You should be embarrassed that some people still don't know about God. I come to you in love, and I'm very sincere about this. Can, can you please stand to your feet, every single person, please? Every, don't move, don't talk, just look at me right now for a moment. If you said the sinner's prayer, and you got baptized, and your life didn't change, you just said words and got wet. It was when you come to Christ, all things become new. Your life changes. Well, I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. And and I know there's people here that love God. There's a lot of people that love God. The question is, are you serving God? Because most of American Christianity, we want God to serve us. What do I mean? We tell God, give me this. Give me that. Give me her. Give me him. Give me that job. Give me this. Give me that. God's up in heaven like, let me get this straight. You want me to do everything you say, but you don't do nothing I say? So I'm going to ask you a very sobering question. I'm going to ask it three times. And I want you to be honest. Here's the motivation. Here's the motivation of honesty. And all the liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Don't lie right now. No matter what the person next to you does, don't lie. You're in a church. We worshiped him. We prayed to him. We read his holy word. Don't lie. I'm going to ask the question three times. I just want you to listen. Don't have to yell out anything. If you died this morning, would you go to heaven? Yes. 